Um, I'm not even really a designer. I, I, the whole thing is completely made up. My only real interest um, when I started was um, welding. And so I started from a very low-tech base, which I think, seeing what's going on in um, South Africa, probably is relevant at the moment. It's not bad, though, to be low-tech. So I started off really when I was much better looking and, and, and younger, maybe 20 years ago, um, more interested in repairing cars and, and motorbikes than designing. And I'm still really learning about design um, from zero. So I still feel outside. And, um, but I'll tell you a few stories about uh, the way I do it, in case you're interested. Um, London at the time, in the, in the early 80s, was full of rubbish. And it was very easy um, when I started making things to um, turn rubbish into money. Um, I didn't ask for a lot of money for it um, because it was still pretty rubbish. But I, I sold very quickly. And that gave me a, a grounding for um, designing. I, I probably made 100 chairs in the first year. And really, I think that when I see people studying design and doing it properly from, from the very beginning, people get very shy very easily. I made all my mistakes live on stage, and they're still coming back to haunt me now. Um, this kind of stuff is, is now getting into auction rooms, and the, the shame I feel is palpable now. Um, but I'm, I'm inspired still by materials, and those materials have evolved from scrap metal to all kinds of things, whether they're plastics or woods. And I think every designer really has that departure point. But um, what's made me distinct is really probably knowing how you make things. You know, I still think that that's fundamentally important, and the balance between the virtual world and the machine um, and, and the handcraft is, is something very important. It's something, again, that I spot here in this conference. Um, is that there's a division between the people that handle things and the people that live in the virtual world. But you've got the potential to bring that together, maybe. So I got slightly better at making chairs, and they became more refined, they became more engineered. And it was really through testing, through destruction, these things were made, people bought them, they sat in them, they collapsed, I made a stronger one, and, and so on, until I got much better at making chairs. Um, I won't bore you with my history, I'm just filling you in here, because there's no reason for you to have ever been to Habitat or ever have seen any of these things. Um, I got interested in um, plastic as well and tried to find ways of diverting industrial production or, or things that weren't normally used for furniture into, into furniture. And that's always been a quick trick, is to spot something which is outside of the design, design industry. In this case, um, rotational moulding, which is um, obviously a very low-cost method of, of making your own mould. So for a long time, I, you know, I built up a, 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 a base from being, I guess, a craftsman, well, not really a craftsman, uh, 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 you know, a welder, um, to being you know, somebody who ran a metalwork factory. I had maybe 20 employees. Um, I had then thought, well, stuff it. I own the means of production, but I, I'm not making the money. The people who have the shops are making the money. So I opened a shop, and I still didn't make any money. And so I thought, well, what I need to do is design for the Italians, because the Italians are the people that make the money for me. So I designed for the Italians, and I still, I really didn't make any money from the Italians. And I think there's a whole front row of designers there that also haven't made any money from the Italians. So if you think that the answer is to go to Italy, right, and design in Europe for um, the Italians, think again, gang. So I got a job, and I got a job at Habitat, which you kindly explained. Now, Habitat is... Uh, you know, probably the first, uh, the inventor of lifestyle, if you like, a, a horrible word, word but the, 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 the first shop which really brought together all of the elements in, in the early 60s of, of the home. You know, up till then, it had been distinct lighting shops and chair shops and tableware shops, all separate. And what Terence Conrad brought to the party was a whole environment and a fantastic name for, for that idea. Um, to, and it was a very fashionable uh, shop for a long time. It's a big business now. Uh, half a billion pounds, that's what? 10 billion rand, is it? Something like that, it's a lot of money. And it's part of the IKEA network, which is an even bigger. IKEA, I don't think you've got one here either. It's, IKEA is, is the biggest furniture and uh, home accessories business in the world. So I, I, I was parachuted into um, a job from being essentially somebody who made my own things to being in one of the biggest um, networks for manufacturing in the world. 
And um, it was a fascinating experience, which I've learned a lot from. I'm not going to tell you any, anything about that now, I don't think. We had to do things like um, there were 6,000 items in the store, and at a 40% turnover a year of design, we had to, uh, I can't do the math, but it's quite a lot of designs anyway, thousands of, of designs a year that we had to process. So I got involved in commissioning other designers. I got involved in... Um, in managing an in-house design team, instituting royalty deals for designers and the rest of it. Um, but essentially, it worked much more like a fashion business than a, a proper industrial design business because you're doing so many different categories of goods. Um, and the job encompassed also doing the catalogues, as mentioned, but also redoing uh, the brand identity, doing some fairly suspect things like introducing celebrity endorsement to the, the firm, which worked fantastically successfully. Um, so these are objects by uh, Manolo Blahnik and various other celebrities. Uh, I got a lot of flack from the design press over there. As to, you know, <laughs> made millions there. Yeah. <laughs> and doing things like the envi store environment, which, uh, which is a very tough job. So uh, creative direction rather than design and a very different job altogether. Much more like being, a, 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 I don't know, a, an orchestra conductor or... or um, or a, 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 a movie director than actually designing. And you know, it's very kind of you to say that I designed the whole lot, but it's phenomenally uh, untrue. I hardly designed anything at all whilst I was there, but what you do is you try and get, engage all of those different forces in trying to see the same vision of the brand. And the brand management, creating a new logo, um, and so on and so forth. So that's what I did at Habitat. I worked in-house for six years, which took me a bit out of the, um, you know, the, the heroic design scene for a while. But um, I've since last year moved away from that. Um, and although I retain the job as creative director there, I'm engaged in all kinds of things. What I did was I, um, I thought, I've kind of had enough of being a service to industry. I don't want a job anymore in, in, a, in a big company where I have to sit in meetings explaining myself again and again. And I don't want to be on my own as an independent designer anymore. So what I did is I, I sold my name. So you're not seeing me up here. I, that's, that's a brand, okay? And I'm, I only own a small portion of, of this thing there. And so I'm in a, in a very particular position, which is closer to a fashion designer um, setup than, than most people here, where my name is now a label which I don't own. So if I choose to not work with, with this, these people anymore, um, <laughs> I'll have to call myself Dick Thompson. So if you see <laughs> a young emerging designer next in Darba called Dick Thompson, don't be fooled, right? Um, but the benefit of... of so I, I went around um, London looking for finance, and I don't know if you've ever met any of the British finance community, but they're very aggressive, um, short-term, not particularly cultural lot in, as a rule. And, um, and it was very hard to try and convince them to invest in, um, in, in anything design-related, which requires you know, a reasonably long-term investment to get anywhere at all. So I, I ended up in Sweden and, uh, with a, a company called Proventus, that uh, are unique in terms of a financial company that believes that design is the only thing left for Western industry to compete in a, in a global environment. So the, this company came um, with a, a, another company, and, and instead of actually just selling my name for the pitiful amount of money that was on, on offer. I swapped um, my name for a part of this much older company called Artec, which is a, a Finnish um, modernist company, probably the only um, company still um, in existence that um, is in its original form from the, from the late 20s, early 30s. You'll probably recognize some of the furniture from the history of design. So I now own part of a of a 70-year-old company called Artec, which is um, a unique company, and it's uh, completely opposite to my own label. So I'm managing two brands. I'm managing my young, groovy, up-and-coming label, which does more plastic and metal and lighting. And on the other hand, I'm, I'm managing a much more solid, more heritage company called Artec. Um, so I thought I had the perfect balance here. I've got, you know, I've got the investment. I'm my own boss. I sit on the board. I've got a Swedish investor that knows what he's talking about in design. Things are looking pretty rosy. So that was about a year ago. Um, but what I didn't really understand was that the Artec furniture um, had been completely undermined, partly by IKEA. So IKEA sell this stool, which is an IKEA stool, for 
eight pounds, 80 rand, I guess, and Artex sell it for 800. The, it's different construction, and it's not nearly as solid, but most people don't recognize the difference. So we were already in there with a problem. The good thing about Artec was its extraordinary tradition, the fact that it brought in people like Picasso and Ligier into Finland for the first time in about 19, 1936, 1937. Arp, Calder, all of the artists came and had shows in the Artec shop. In fact, I'm now a part owner of a very small Ligier. So if you don't know, Ligier was the cubist that worked with the Picasso or was in competition with Picasso. And I own, okay, it's this big, and I own that much as part of my inheritance. <laughs> Um, and this cultural history is something which is, which is unique. I mean, I don't know, you can't really read any of these invitations, but in, in the archives at Artec in Helsinki, there's all of these invites to these fantastic shows by all of these geniuses of, of modernism, which is quite um, humbling, I'd say, to be part of that organisation. But the problem with Finland is, um, which is the other thing I didn't realise, is that it's been squeezed between Russia and Sweden since it existed. So the big Soviet bear on one side, which has caused it all kinds of problems, and the, on the other hand, what they regard as the arrogant Swedes. So they don't like outs outsiders very much. And it's a very small country with six million people on the, um, you know, just by the Arctic Circle. And they kind of thought that we were not the right kind of people to be managing the company. This is the vision that the people in Helsinki have of the British, which is, you know, looks basically and so we've had a, a hard time overcoming you know the, the resistance and even getting to a point where we can start moving the company forward um, it's a company which has very proud of its heritage but unfortunately really hasn't um, moved forward in it has had no product development for 50 years so it's tough to know how to move it forward and the thing about Finland is that you have to do business in saunas <laughs> and I'm not joking but the deals that you strike you know, the salesmen will come in in the morning in Helsinki. They'll be drunk, you know, at 10 o'clock in the morning. And we've just sealed the deal in the sauna. We had three, we three had three vodkas in the sauna and we sealed the deal for this school or for this. So it's, it's a traditional thing and it's not a joke. They do this. And worse than that, <laughs> you have to go from the sauna to the ice hole. <laughs> this is what I have to do for design now. So I took the money. I took the money, and um, now I'm, 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 I've got the payback, really. So Artec has got a lot of great things going for it. Its knowledge of um, birch wood is supreme, beyond what anybody else has got probably in the world. Um, and that's something which I think you, you, you don't buy. It's something you accumulate over 70 years. So it's got, it's got some great assets which are intangible at the moment, which I can talk about in terms of marketing and, and its positioning in the market and so on. It's got solidity to it, which... If you explain properly to people, people get it. You know, there's still chairs in kindergartens in Helsinki that are 70 years old, meaning that the, the previous slide of the IKEA stool, which might last a year or two, in comparison with something which has lasted 70 years and been sat on every day, is actually a very cheap piece of furniture rather than what appears to be uh, an expensive one. So the solidity and, and, and the unfashionability of it is something which is phenomenally important. Um, in terms of, of a competitive advantage worldwide. And I think, you know, that this unfashionability is something which is un under-understood in furniture at the moment. Um, Finland also manages its natural resources in an extraordinary way, which I think, you know, South Africa could certainly take some um, um, lessons from. It's great that you're planting a few trees there, but just the amount of fuel I burnt on the way over on my own um, in fact, the South African pilot was very proudly telling us that we'd burnt, uh, I think it was 150 tonnes of the gear on the way over. So we were all feeling a bit middle-class guilt by the time we got here. But the Finns are very good at managing, because they make huge amounts of money out of mainly paper, actually. Um, they, they do manage and, and believe in their environment. They all go away uh, every weekend to their, to their cottages, and they all have a, a holiday home or an island. It's a, it's a, it's a merging of... of, of um, industry and nature, which is, which is great. And everybody loves the tree anyway, so that's another benefit of Artec. I think there's a space for a natural company um, out there in the world right now. Everybody's so, so plasticky and chromey at the moment that I think there's a little space for Artec in, in the office world. 
And what's, what's great about Finland as well is that they invest in technology, their networks, because they are um, completely ununderstood worldwide in terms of their language. Nobody, nobody gets it. I, I only know two words since I've been working there for a year and a half. And, but so, so they've been very good at networking their world and, and becoming good at virtual. And also investing in technology because of um, high-tech companies like Nokia that are based there. So the government actually um, invests in companies. And we've received, for instance, a, a quarter of a million euro grant from the, the Finnish government to investigate technology and business. Now, that wouldn't happen in South Africa. It wouldn't happen in the UK or in France or the states for that matter, government actually investing in firms would be seen as counter-competitive, I should imagine. But in Finland, people actually do invest in, in, in what they see as winners. So in that very fortunate position, as one of the few international, uh, internationally recognized firms in Finland to actually get government support. Um, so I'll be spending that wisely on technology. And um, so you, what you see, you know, for sure, as the future of our tech isn't so much what I get from all the Finnish designers, which is lots and lots more Alvar Alto-like Bentwood furniture, but what you should see coming out in Milan um, fairly, you know, I hope in April, is some things which are also technology-led. You see a lot of um, robots in Finnish factories that are underutilized. So I'm busy investigating that possibility, but unfortunately I can't show you anything yet because it's all top secret. Sorry. Um, the Finns are, are good at designing. They've got their own aesthetic, which is very important to maintain an aesthetic. And I think a big danger, obviously, for people in South Africa is that they end up having an international aesthetic and, and not retaining their local characteristic. I think local characteristics are going to become increasingly important now, given that everything's global. There's only one way to go again, which is local. And if you look at what's happened, for instance, with food, certainly in the UK, we're in a position now where we used to only eat curry as a, as a national dish. But we're, we, we moved on. We're now able to buy sushi in the supermarket, and we can buy Thai food and anything we like. The biggest story in the UK at the moment is local. It's what you can buy in your backyard. It's the, the chicken that you've reared and the egg that, that you've, you've actually had produced for you in your backyard. Um, all the good restaurants that I, I recommend to my friends now are British restaurants. And local is becoming increasingly important. So don't forget that. So we're using local designers in, in Finland. We're using Eero Arno, who's famous for the ball chair, which is a, you know, a, a great classic from the, from the 60s. And I'm trying to reintroduce uh, the missing history of our tech. So trying to fill in that gap between, um, between the 30s and, and now. I thought I'd give you a couple of um, ways that I design right now. So what I do, I, I, I specialize really in lighting this, this, um, this year. Lights are a fantastic place to work because they are where people are prepared to buy innovation. It's, you know, increasingly in chairs and tables or even sofas, people are, are, are pretty conservative. They've got, um, they've got to live with these things for 10 or 15, 20 years, maybe a lifetime. Maybe they want to pass them on to their children. So you find that furniture is becoming increasingly conservative, at least in Europe. I don't know what it's like here. Um, and the place where innovation really happens is in the lighting industries. It's kind of fantastic because there's always new bulbs, new light sources, new electronic gizmos that make them, um, new films that are arriving from the space race that you can use to make exotic lighting. And because it's sort of separate from your furnishings, you, you believe you can change it when you like. And there's been this big new fashion for chandeliers and what have you. So lighting is good. I can recommend lighting. And, you know, I've, I've worked for a long time doing lights from, you know, the snap-together plastic lights to big chandeliers for Swarovski. And um, I've, I've become increasingly cynical about designers. I've gone through the 6,000 products at Habitat and done the International Design Yearbook and seen 5,000 items in, in the period of, of two days. And, there's so much design around that in my personal work, I've been trying to do almost nothing. In fact, a sort of anti-design movement of my own, where I try and do as little design as possible, and I want to reduce it down to the bare minimum. So I had this idea that my next light would be this. It would be something which was um, so non-designed, it had a, just a, a, an existing shape of some sort, that it would be almost invisible as a light, because I didn't want this light to be... Um, to be even seen. I want it to be the stealth light where um, nobody would actually know that there was a light in the room. And so my idea was to, to produce this non-design which nobody could see. And um, 
so this was my goal. And um, I've become increasingly interested by some of the more high-tech methods of covering plastic, which uh, in this case is called vacuum metallization, where they put you know, five grams of aluminium into a vacuum chamber and explode it into the middle of this globe um, to get this really micron-thin smattering of, of silver over the plastic globe. And um, that would give me a mirrored surface where instead of seeing the light, what we used, you'd see was the reflection of everything around it. As I was convinced that I was very close to achieving my perfect dream, which was the invisible lamp. Um, it was going to look like a ball of mercury or something. It was going to be a, a non-design. And so I got there, and, and, um, and this lamp is actually, a, although a commercial success, is a miserable failure in terms of its, of its initial um, you know, design brief, if you like. This is, you know, the disco ball of all lighting. It's the most visible thing you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> Instead of reflecting the surroundings around it, it looks like, uh, it looks like it's been introduced from a disco. And it does, you know, I've been, I've been surprised by the success of this non-invisible light because what it seems to be doing is really being more part of the bling culture than anything else. It's that, you know, Paris Hilton sunglasses is what it is, you know, that accessory that people put in their room to just finish it off and, and give themselves a bit of fashionability. So just to point out that, you know, sometimes you set out on one route. I'm sure any designer in the room will have done this. <laughs> you set out on, on, on one route, which is, you know, very clear path. But don't, you know, beware, you know, sometimes the biggest mistakes are the biggest uh, successes. And that's something I've, I've, I've really learnt uh, on my way, that accidental design is almost as good as the real thing, sometimes better. So Ravi insisted that I talk about sex. And um, as an interlude, because you've been hearing a lot about design, I thought I'd oblige, even though it's really embarrassing for Englishmen. <laughs> you know, we don't... We don't talk about it. We don't even do it that much, actually. Right? <laughs> Especially in Cape Town, eh, Marcus? <laughs> so, it's... I, I had a very strange meeting in, um, in London with two young ladies that had been working at Tesco's, which is a big... Um, food chain, in, the biggest uh, retail chain in the UK. And they'd left the marketing department. They had this great idea for a sex shop, or rather a lingerie shop. And what they wanted to do was to um, ask uh, four or five designers to do vibrators. And it was a good idea because, you know, frankly, the ones that are on the market are uh, kind of ugly. And in fact, I was, I was very taken aback with the whole idea. But the girls came in with a, a whole box full of these things. Um, and and they, they put them on my table, and it was a, a kind of frightening moment. And I, I looked at them, <laughs> and I got out a scalpel, and I cut one open. And for the men in the room, that's a very disturbing moment. <laughs> I sort of sliced it open. And it's clear that everything about vibrators is wrong. From a designer's perspective, it's, it's wide open. And again, it's a, a lesson that is... Um, uh, that I've learned is that all too often designers are always looking at the same fields. If I see another designer chair downstairs or in Cape Town, I'll, I'll, I'll scream, I can't look at chairs anymore. But there's lots of places where design actually isn't happening that much. And one of those is the sex industry. And so when, when you slice open a, a, a vibrator, you, you find all kinds of problems with it. It's got a very cheap motor, for instance. So if you switch it on, it makes this really loud noise. I, I, I don't know if you have vibrators in South Africa, but... <laughs> Switch one on one day and you'll see that actually it's very bad engineering. Um, the other thing that I... So after deliberating for a while about whether um, I'd do this because I didn't want my mother to find out, that I, I, I decided to go for it, although I thought really it was a job for a woman, you know, a woman designer, not a man designer. But it was such an opportunity in every sense of the word for me to talk about sex you know, in a more comfortable way, but also to... to add you know, the, the bits I'd learnt into, into a field where there didn't appear to be much design. Because everything's wrong about designers. For the start, <laughs> about vibrators. <laughs> they're, in the main, they're comical. I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't think it's funny, right? It's, it's um, you know, in, in those intimate moments, 
I mean, Germans think that sex is funny, right? But I think it's actually quite serious, you know. It's, a, it's one of those things which should be beautiful, right? It shouldn't be comical. I don't want, I don't want a, a rubber duck dildo. <laughs> and I don't. And so I, I figured that the girls didn't either. And then the packaging is the most ugly stuff that you've ever seen in your life. The, the photography, the, the quality of the, of the packaging, the, the quality of the plastic particularly is, is appalling. Um, they're all in silicon, which I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to use it a second time, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I don't want, I don't want the, the thing to be the shape of a rabbit. I mean, I wouldn't want it to be the shape of a rabbit if I used them. You know, I'd like it to have a more mysterious quality. You know, it'd be, it'd be nice to be able to have a vibrator where you could just leave it out. You didn't have to put it in a drawer where you were... <laughs> that wasn't supposed to be a joke, right? <laughs> okay, that's not a vibrator, right? It's just a nice object that you could leave out. It'd be nice to think that a vibrator could be like a piece of jewellery, which was of high quality. You know, the materials were of high quality, something you'd treasure, maybe. And it'd be, you know, if you put something next to your body, do you really want it to be made out of the cheapest possible plastic um, that people can find? Do you really, you know, in those most intimate moments, do you really want something which only costs, you know, 30 bucks down there? I mean, I, I was suspicious that there was a big opportunity there, is what I'm trying to say. You know, wouldn't it be nice if a vibrator was more like a, like a, a sculpture, a contemporary sculpture? Um, and, and that even if you were taking somebody to a lingerie shop, they could bring their kids, and the kids wouldn't be saying, what's that rabbit thing, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> and wouldn't it be nice if it had a proper engine, you know? <laughs> I wanted to have the Rolls-Royce of engines. And, so, and because, you know, in the end, you want it to throb. You don't want it to buzz, you know? You want it to throb. And Again, the, the sex industry is a victim of its own cheapness, really. The, the fact that it doesn't even bother putting a proper, a proper motor in there when every, every mobile phone's got a vibrating device, which is you know, discreet, efficient, small, and the rest of it. So there was a lot of room for design in this job, OK? And you know, the, the biggest room for design in the job was the fact that almost all the price points of vibrators are, are within a very tight bracket between 15 pounds and 35 pounds pretty much. There aren't any super expensive vibrators, there are only super cheap ones, they're all within that bracket, they're all cheaply made. So there's a big money opportunity there for somebody who, who brought through a vibrator. So after all of this, anyway, you're going to be quite disappointed with this. But, uh, so I started off with a, with a proper piece of jewellery. I, I used a vibrator from a mobile phone, I used a, a watch battery to do a ring. Kate Moss bought one, so that was my big success. But, the problem was that the girls, in their wisdom, decided they wanted to preserve the economy of the battery. And so they put a cutout after 30 seconds. <laughs> so it was useless. But the second model was, was much better. And so here's the, the sculptural piece, which is made out of a nicer material, which is in a packaging, which is fully complete, and which actually um, has a rechargeable thing. So it doesn't have a battery pack hanging off it. It doesn't run out of batteries. Um, it's kind of, you know, and it's very expensive, you know, it's, um, it's 150 pounds. So it's the most expensive, where it was at the time, the most expensive in the world. But what it did as a result was to be the only expensive vibrator in the world, which made it, you know, the biggest success in the range. So there you go. And if I were you, go into other industries. It doesn't have to be the sex one, because I know some people are prude like me. It can be other, there's, there's a lot of places where design hasn't actually accessed. And I think, you know, people are the victim of, of repeating um, quite often the same, you know, the same as they see around them. I got a, a question on, I got two questions on the design, sh on the Cape, Cape Talk radio program yesterday. First one, what, what is design? So, second one, how do you tell a good design? And I have to say that I couldn't really answer that simple question about my own profession. It's like, what's a good design then? I mean, I've got no idea. It's such a broad field now, isn't it? I mean, it's fashion design downstairs, it's craft, 
its invention, its engineering, its graphic design, its multimedia. And so, you know, what's a good design, what's a bad design is almost you know, immaterial now. There's this fantastic fashion design. I've been involved in styling just as much as anybody else. It's not like I'm being critical of the fact that, um, that people are, are often rebodying or, or rehashing old ideas. I've been doing exactly the same myself in some of my work. You can't always be totally original. But when things look like this, which is that every color is fashionable and every period is fashionable, it gets very difficult to decide what to do next, don't you think? And um, so, you know, you've got to do a bit of self, uh, soul searching, really. And I think, you know, the, the other thing that's happening at the moment, apart from this eclecticism, which makes that everything is, is plausible, everything is fashionable, everything is possible, is um, the, the general fear of, of low-cost manufacturing, which is happening all around the world. I think all of us, you know, from any industry, are, are, are really trying to understand how to deal with the amount of goods that are coming over from, um, from Asia. Um, I've been there, and it's kind of terrifying in the way that People are just making things, whether people are ready to consume or not. So the, the containers are full of... of um, you know that 40% of the containers coming back from China are empty now. There's a big trade imbalance, and it's getting worse every week. And I think, you know, looking at the news, um, and in fact going up in the helicopter just a half hour ago, um, and seeing, you know, seeing your, your mountain burning, it's just, you know, it brings it home all the time, the Filipino earthquake. Uh, um, you know, the tsunami, all that, all that environmental stuff is something that everybody's got to be kind of conscious of. And I think that the vision of the future that people sold us when we were young has completely vanished now, this idea that we'd all be living a, a better life. It's the first generation that exists now that believes that their children are going to have a worse, a worse future than they have themselves. So there's a serious thing going on. There's a lack of confidence in the future, which is um, uh, deliberating. Delib it's deli well, anyway, it's bad. <laughs> Debilitating is what it is. <laughs> you know, it's, um, it's, it's a kind of terrifying future that, that, that faces us. And I think, you know, with these people in, in charge of our children's future, we've got every reason to be scared. You know, there's, the, the future is, is, um, is not what it was painted for us. And I think, you know, what we'd hoped, which was that everything was going to be new and, and, and special and different, is, um, is, is kind of less and less likely to happen. So this is more my vision of the future at the moment, which is, you know, something quite scary. And I'm trying to understand how to deal with it myself. Um, and so what I do, you know, as a result, is I go back to making things myself because I feel a bit more comfortable that way. So I'll just tell you about one more project before we pack it in. I've always been interested in, in machinery and I've also, you know, in, in big industry and in craft. And what I'd, what I'd been doing is going into plastic factories looking for, um, for materials and, and colours and stuff. And I'd, I'd um, got to the stage where I'd seen these fantastic um, extrusion machines which, when they change colours, um, they allow the plastic to drop on the floor in a, in a kind of random mess. And so these small plastic changes of colour that exist on shop factory floors um, were, were the sort of things that the factory workers took home with them, the most beautiful bits of, of um, just random. And just, I was trying to recreate this as an industrial design, so I took the front end off the machine and I started making, um, making some furniture again in, in, in the old-fashioned way, just, you know, just for pleasure, really. But it brought up all kinds of interesting um, possibilities because I think you know uh, what, what's happened in in terms of um, of uh, certainly how you sell how you sell um, goods these days has, has been it's gone from local production to being international production, which means that retailers or wholesalers have to stock huge amounts of goods. They have to predict you know three, four, five, maybe six months in advance in Habitat's case, a year and a half in advance, what people are going to buy. And it means it's a, a, a massively inefficient means of, of, of manufacturing. So I think every manufacturer, whether it's Levi's or smart cars, are looking at this possibility of making to order. There'd be nothing better for a, a manufacturer or retailer to, than to make the thing um, after the customer had paid. And so this was, a, although it was an experiment just in craft versus the machine kind of thing, or man, man and machine together, it ended up being much more about um, just-in-time production, production where, where people could actually influence the, um, the, the, the way their object was made. Um, you should be able, with, with a machine of this size, to um, make to order so that people could buy chairs as, um, just like they buy bread, a, a, fresh, a fresh, warm chair 
made to order in the color of their choice or the size of their choice, including the weave of their choice. So even, even here, I was able to change the color of the plastic um, with 40 different colors. Um, if I was a, a normal plastic chair manufacturer ordering chairs from China, I'd be in a position where the minimum quantity would be a ton, just of the color. You can't buy color batch in less than a ton. You'd have to get a minimum of a 40-foot container to make it worth your while. You'd have to stick it in a warehouse um, once it, it cleared customs. And then you'd have to distribute it to all your points of sale. So in terms of, of the potential of, of, of local manufacturing, and this is what I'm getting to, is that you know, there's still means of, of, of doing things which, um, which you can't do in China or in Vietnam. You know, you, manufacturing um, domestically is possible even with industrial machines. So the interesting thing about this project turned from being, you know, should designers be involved in hand-making things anymore, to being really about what the future of selling and making objects might look like. Oh. Um, and so the, the, the results were that. And again, on top of that, what, what that brings up is all kinds of questions about um, the nature of materials and the, uh, the perception of value in, in materials. I mean, clearly, plastic is, is no longer a disposable material. Um, you know, it's clear that as, as uh, oil reaches $65 a, a barrel, um, we have to start changing the way that we think about it. So if you look at this chair, um, which is highly wasteful in terms of um, plastic, it's probably got uh, 25 kilos, so the same as a sack of cement in weight. It's a phenomenally uneconomical way to use plastic, but it's got the same characteristics as the Artec chair I was describing earlier, which is that with any luck, if you do your design right, this will become something that will last 70 years and won't last the two or three years that plastic chairs do in the normal environments in the sun. So you're treating the plastic more like you're treating, say, glass than you are treating it plastic. So through experiments like this, very easy to post-rationalize, but you know, again, it, it brings you know, this idea of accidental design or, or, or doing things without you know, a proper motive, the experimentation side of it, um, to, to become kind of useful. And if you doubt what I'm saying, which is that eventually people will be manufacturing chairs in a very different way, you've only got to look at some of the experiments that are happening in Belgium, for instance, and in France, which are about um, producing from rapid prototyping, we know that people are now able to make rapid prototype chairs. Um, the, the whole nature of the distribution system and, and, and the way that things are created, it will change. And there's no doubt that, you know, I can remember a time when I wanted, you know, if I wanted to have a color photocopy, for instance, it would cost me a huge amount of money. I would have to go and, and get things printed professionally and, and so on. Um, and now you can do it at home, yeah? And the same thing will start happening to three-dimensional objects. And it's clear that we're now in a position where um, it's possible to sell a disc to somebody and they can go and get a, an object printed in their local rapid prototyping shop. So what you're selling in effect is uh, intellectual property rather than the actual object itself. So no longer do you need to ship these objects around the world or wait for them for three months if you're a South African and you want something from Belgium. You can actually print something in your own, in your own backyard. So I think we'll see the nature and it's quite an exciting time now, I know the future is scary, but at the same time, there's things going on in, in science, craft, technology, and, and the rest of it, which are also potentially very exciting. And these things already exist. Obviously, most of you have seen these extraordinary lights from a company called Materialize in Belgium, which, um, which demonstrate that, yeah, we can now make um, lamps which were previously um, impossible to make. So I think we're living in, in a time which is uh, most exciting. Um, I'm trying to think of what I put that up for. It's a, I think you know, the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that designers will have to go beyond just designing objects in the near future. It's no longer good enough to be somebody who's just interested in form making as it was previously. People have got to be interested in the material side of it. They've got to be interested in its impact in the world. It's got to be interested in also the whole chain of events that happens from the procurement of the material to the, to the customer journey into the shop. You've also got to be interested in marketing. You've got to be interested in fashion. You've got to be interested in art and all the things that are peripheral to design. And I think that you know, if the, the great thing about the Indaba that I've learned is that that 
um, that connection between all these different trades is happening right here in South Africa. So you've got a great opportunity in the next couple of days to actually make all of that happen. Because I don't think um, design is, you know, in answer to the journalist's question on Cape Talk, I don't think design is one thing. I think design is a whole process, a, a series of events that happen together to, to end up in possibly an object. Try to tell me something. Um, and we'll see things, you know, what we know is also that things will, will start to be making themselves fairly soon. Nanorobots. And it doesn't matter, you know, I've traveled a lot, you know, like I said, just recently I've been trying to do um, projects in, in Lagos, which is nigh on impossible, and in Jaipur, which is slightly easier to do. It doesn't matter what type of designer and what type of manufacturing you're talking about, whether it's the highest tech which is coming now or the, or the lowest tech, which is the sort of thing that you need to deal with in, in, in the whole of Africa right now, is that design really can improve things in a way um, if it's used in a, in, a, in, a, in a more clever way than just giving forms to things. So, um, yeah, whether it's robots or whether it's uh, the street tinkers in Jaipur, I do think design has got a future. And I think I'm going to leave it there for the time being. <laughs>